Well, um, Charles, thank you so much for that very uh, gracious introduction. And my sincere thanks to all of you for being here this evening and for sharing the very generous gift of your time. Uh, this is a very special privilege for me for a number of reasons. Um, I have tremendous respect for the work of the Asia Society and specifically the work of Asia Society Texas Center. Uh, it is an extraordinary facility that's making enormous contributions here in Houston and in Texas and, and even at a national level. And I'm very proud to be affiliated uh, with you in terms of this evening's talk. There's another very particular reason that this means a lot to me. Uh, my mom was from Houston. Uh, she literally grew up in the house that is catty corner to this building on Caroline and uh, Southmore, literally a stone's throw across the street. And so as I look out, there's a, there's a fraction of a window that I can see there, and I can literally see my mom's childhood home, no joke from here as I'm sitting and talking. So that gives the evening even more special resonance to me. And um, I'm really glad to be here. I know we have somewhat limited time, and so what I'd like to do, and Kelly is very kindly pulling, uh, pulling up the um, a map of the South China Sea, which will be the one visual that I would perhaps think is useful for tonight. I don't have a PowerPoint or other uh, props. But uh, the topic at hand is the South China Sea, and specifically this notion of um, can military uh, escalation be avoided? So tonight what I'd like to do is to share with you uh, some thoughts I have on the issue of the South China Sea, which I think is a very topical and very timely issue. Uh, I should note, uh, with reference to just how timely it is, uh, the U.S. and Chinese presidents will literally be meeting tomorrow. And in their, 90, their planned 90-minute meeting uh, in Washington, and this is on the margins of the Nuclear Security Summit, uh, they will be addressing, among other topics, among a limited number of other topics, probably the issue of the South China Sea, as well as North Korea and other issues. So this is truly a front burner uh, question. It is of central importance in the relationship and in anyone who's looking at what China is doing in the world. So uh, what I'd like to do is offer a very brief and kind of general overview of the issue for those who may not be as deeply steeped in the issue. Uh, second, I'd like to talk a little bit about China's position on the South China Sea issue, broadly speaking. Then I'd like to talk about the positions of the other players, but quite frankly, with special emphasis on the United States. Now, the United States is not a claimant to any of the territories or waters in the South China Sea, but for reasons that I'll explain, the United States has very significant national interests in the South China Sea. I'll then talk about the current state of play and then share a few analytical observations uh, and then toward the end of my talk put forward a few ideas about possible solutions, po possible uh, policy ideas that could help uh, mitigate the potential negative consequences of increasing uh, tensions or even outright conflict in the South China Sea. And at the end of that I will offer a few concluding thoughts. So that's the basic map of what I'd like to do this evening. And I'll try to keep my comments uh, to about uh, 30 minutes or so, and then leave the remaining time for any questions or comments that you might have, because I very much value uh, the opportunity to hear uh, from you and to exchange ideas with you about these issues. So let me start with, if I may, a brief uh, overview of the issue of the South China Sea. We hear about it, it's in the news, but when we talk about South China Sea, what are we really talking about? Uh, and let me say right at the outset, I'm not gonna go into the extraordinary, in some cases, thousands of years of history and the historical case that each country and claimant makes to the different uh, islands, reefs, and so on, because to lay out the case for any of the six claimants would take a full graduate course uh, in itself. So let's just say in, in very basic terms what this issue is really all about. Basically you have a body of water called the South China Sea that is extends from China's southern coast uh, uh, across the Vietnamese coast, the Philippines, and down 
to Brunei, Malaysia, and Indonesia. The six claimants who have uh, mutually and exclusively incompatible claims to some or even all of the islands and water in this body of water are China and Taiwan separately, and I'll explain that in a second, Vietnam, the Philippines, and then Malaysia and Brunei. Of the six, Brunei has the smallest claim and is not really a central player in this issue in a significant way. Uh, but it, in fact, uh, is one of the six claimants. Malaysia has the second smallest claim and is in a, in a position of less friction. You see toward the south of the map, the red dotted line essentially shows you where the, where the key conflicts and tensions are. And Malaysia uh, is in the mix, but relatively lightly. In the, let me say at, at the outset, there's an interesting quirk to this issue, and that is that mainland China has a particular claim to essentially all of what you see within the red dotted line, and I'll talk more about that. But Taiwan, in its capacity, self-defined capacity as the Republic of China, as distinct from the People's Republic of China, makes exactly the same claim for itself. So mainland China's claim and Taiwan's claim are exactly contiguous. The difference is that mainland is claiming the water and the land features for the People's Republic of China, and Taiwan is claiming exactly the same thing for the Republic of China on Taiwan, otherwise known as Taiwan. Um, but the key players really are China and Vietnam and the Philippines. And the fact is, in the Paracel Islands, which you see toward the top of the body of water, just below the word South China Sea, and the, the Spratleys, which you see lower uh, down in the map, uh, those are the two sets of islands, and particularly the Spratleys, where there are very hotly contested disputes about who owns which islands, which reefs, which land features, which rocks that jut out of the water, and also importantly, therefore, who owns the territorial waters that extend out to a radius of 12 miles around each point, and perhaps even more importantly, the exclusive economic zones, or EEZs, that extend out 200 nautical miles from whatever point of land is at issue. One point that I would make at the outset to kind of frame this issue <clears throat> and put it in perspective, is that if you were to take all of the land that is contested in the South China Sea and add it all together, the entire landmass would be about half the size of the island of Manhattan. That is how much land is actually contested in the South China Sea. But it is spread out with a rock here, a reef there, a low tide jutting rock or, or land feature here, all across these many, many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of square miles of water. And what quickly becomes clear is that the land is not really what the issue is. What is really at issue, and I'll explain this in more detail, is the amount of water that the land can control. Because when you own a rock or an island in a piece of water, that gives you, under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, a territorial sea, territorial waters that extend out 12 miles in all directions, and as I noted, an, an exclusive economic zone that extend out 200 miles in all directions. And so one little rock unto itself may have virtually no value, but the waters that it commands could be enormously rich in resources and monetizable uh, resources that can be uh, used by the country in question and exported to other markets. So those are the kind of issues that are at play. Um, each of the claimants have distinct historical and legal claims that they would make. Those claims are incompatible and generally mutually exclusive for the most part, particularly when it comes to China, Vietnam, and the Philippines. In other words, you have different people, different countries, saying that they have lawful rights to own and be exercise sovereignty over the same piece of territory, and that doesn't work. And so, hence, we have a conflict. 
This has been a long simmering issue, but it has not generally been a major problem up until about five or six years ago. So for a long time, these competing claims were there. No one really agreed on who owns what. Some would occupy this island, others would occupy that island. Almost everyone, in fact, every, all of the six claimants have on at least one island uh, in the South China Sea built uh, at least one airstrip, for example. China, by the way, is not the only one that's done that. You've probably read that China has been doing that, but all of them have done it. But basically, it's not something most of us probably ever heard of until very recently. But in the last several years, it has really ramped up for a number of different reasons. And now the situation today in the, in the South China Sea is one that is getting top headlines and that is commanding the attention of presidents of countries, including ours, even though the United States is not a claimant to any of the land or water. Uh, and thus, uh, this has become a front burner issue in the world. So that's the overall situation, is you have this dispute, it is multilateral, and it seemingly is utterly intractable, which is to say, and I'll just say this here and I'll reiterate it later, I don't think that there is any, uh, let's put it this way, within my lifetime, within uh, you know, the foreseeable future, I don't think there's any scenario in which the fundamental legal claims are resolved to the satisfaction of all. So this issue is going to be with us, and I'll talk about what the implications of that are. So that's the basic overview of the issue. And with that being said, let me talk a little bit about China's position and China's viewpoints about this particular issue. Um, so long story short, China makes the claim that based on quite literally thousands of years of history, and they can go back, and they do go back to point to historical documents and records and things literally dug up, you know, and ex excavated from time immemorial, that basically make it clear, in the Chinese point of view, that this body of water has always been considered part of China. That basically what you see with the red line, and this is not an official document, but that very accurately, broadly captures the body of water in question, that China says, this is all ours. And they actually have in place a posture, a position on the South China Sea issue that can be referred to as the nine dash line policy. And the nine dash line essentially is that red line, but the reason it's called the nine dash line is because on Chinese maps dating back to the Republic of China period in 1946, during the Chinese Civil War, before the People's Republic of China existed as a nation, which, which started on October 1st, 1949, there were maps that showed nine dashes, essentially that red line, but with nine dashes, and it essentially was an official position of the Chinese government that everything within that belonged to China. Later, it was modified to an 11 dash line, then I think originally it was 11, then it became nine, and ultimately, the claim essentially stood out there. Meanwhile, other countries like Vietnam, the Philippines, and to a lesser degree, Malaysia, and Brunei, and again, Taiwan's claim being identical to the mainland's, it, in 1946, there was only one China. It was the Republic of China, and it was one claim. It was only after 1949 that it became two. But the other countries, don't see the issue the same way, and they can pull up historical records, history, legal arguments, arguments rooted in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and so on, to make what they regard as equally compelling and convincing and sound legal claims that, in fact, these islands and those reefs and this body of water belongs to us. By the way, none of the other claimants claim the entirety of the body of water. Only China does. That's empirically true. But the others claim parts of it. So China's position is that uh, this basically belongs to China, even though with respect to the nine dash line, China has refrained in recent years and decades from authoritatively demarking exactly where in legal terms the nine dash line is. And what I'm saying here is they literally have a map that has a nine dash line on it. 
it doesn't say 42 degrees 0.6 and 49 degrees latitude or whatever the ways that you actually legally demark a point on the earth. It's just the dotted line that someone drew on a piece of paper. But it has become essentially official policy, but China is unwilling or unable to e explain officially exactly where the demarcation is. And when pressed, China is also unwilling to say that they are making a claim to the entirety, but they're also unwilling to say that they're not making a claim to the entirety of the land and the water. So within China's own official position, there is some ambiguity. In fact, I would call it, and this is a term used in other contexts, but it's a kind of strategic ambiguity from the Chinese standpoint, which I think they believe gives them room to maneuver, gives them room to stake out positions, to be tactical, to try to advance their interests in a way that has some flexibility. So they have an, a, a somewhat ambiguous position, but it, it may be up to and including the entirety, it may be some subset thereof. Now why does China say that it, it, it is, uh, well, let me back up one step. In recent years, in particular, China has made a very serious and concerted and sustained effort to reclaim land from the sea, to dredge up sediment from the surface of the relatively shallow ocean or sea, and to put it on top of these land features and build out the islands to make them larger than they were. And they've been doing that now very aggressively for a number of years. China is not the only country that has done that. Most of the countries involved have done that to one degree or another. But what China has done in the last five or six years, has create, they have created land mass that is artificial, that is created from the dredged se sediment that now exceeds the combined total of what all of the other claimants have done together. So they are, in a sense, coming to the party late, but they are making up for lost time by being very active and very aggressive. In recent years, in the last couple of years in particular, China has essentially um, not only dredged up the land and built out the islands and reclaimed the land and expanded their phys what the physical territory that they control, even though that territory is disputed. But the fact is, in many cases, they control these places and they are in a position to expand it. Not only have they expanded the physical island footprint, they have actually built things on those islands, including airports, ports, facilities, buildings, in some cases, and very recently, radar installations, at least based on satellite imagery, that's what they appear to be, and most troublingly, uh, surface-to-air missiles, actual weapons, which is a first. Uh, and so there is an increasing sense of alarm and concern about what China's doing. When one asks China, you know, why is China doing, when one asks Chinese officials, or for that matter, scholars and others, but particularly officials who speak for the government, why is China doing what it's doing, they give a number of answers. The main answer they give is we need to be able to get, uh, if there is a humanitarian assistance scenario or disaster relief scenario, a tsunami, a boat gets, uh, a boat breaks down, and there are people that need help, we need to have a forward leaning base of operations so that we can be good Samaritans and good neighbors and help the people that may be in need, whoever they might be. So they make what we call an HADR argument or humanitarian assistance disaster relief argument. We want to be there, we want to be like a good neighbor and, uh, and therefore we need to have a presence. Um, many people in Vietnam, and in the Philippines, in the United States, which is not a claimant, but nevertheless has an interest, which I'll talk about, and Malaysia, Brunei, and so on, don't accept that argumentation. But that being said, in fairness, they too have often done some of the very things they're criticizing the Chinese for, <laughs> even if not on the same scale. But suffice it to say, there are question marks about whether that's a legitimate line of reasoning. The second thing, the second kind of thing China says is, well, we have... Uh, weather equipment in this body of water, we need to be able to see what's happening, test for you know whether the tides are rising, whether hurricanes are coming, 
or those kinds of scientific and technical matters. Um, but that type of explanation doesn't explain why they have surface-to-air missiles and so forth and so on. So to put it, you know, to, to be fair to China, they make the point, uh, and one can accept or not accept their argumentation, that, and many don't accept it, that they are there for benign reasons, and they are simply, number one, you know, doing something within their own sovereign territory and water, in their judgment, and number two, what they're doing is benign, it does not represent any sinister intentions. It does not pose any threats to the United States or to others, uh, or more fundamentally, to China's neighbors. So that's what China basically says uh, that it's doing. Um, in fact, overall, China would say that it is reacting to what Vietnam and the Philippines, and to a lesser degree others, but particularly Vietnam and the Philippines, have done in recent years. And they're saying, look, they're getting away with murder, and so we need to be standing up for ourselves and doing the same thing, lest we fall behind, lest we be disadvantaged. That's their view. Now, I would offer my own assessment to supplement the official assessments that are offered by the Chinese to say that I think there are a number of reasons that the Chinese don't explicitly state, uh, but that I think are very, uh, very straightforward. Uh, why is this body of water important in the first place? And, the, and I'll come to the point about why I think China is really doing what it's doing. First and foremost, five trillion dollars of global trade flow through those waters within those red lines. Five trillion dollars. Uh, a massive percentage of the entire Earth's trade. Uh, about two trillion of that is, you, is trade that involves the United States. So it's either stuff that we're sending or it's stuff that, that people are, in other words, buying from us, or it is stuff that we are buying from others. And so a very significant percentage of our GDP flows through that body of water. So it's an enormously important trade conduit in the world. That's one reason why this body of water matters an awful lot. Uh, and we all understand, and no one understands it better than the Asia Society, Asia is the engine of global economic growth, period. It is, it is the engine. It does account for the majority, statistically, of global economic growth, the Asia-Pacific region. So this matters in an economic and trade standpoint. But it's also true that there are uh, very substantial untapped energy resources under the bed of that water. And what has been assessed thus far is that there may be up to 170 trillion cubic feet of natural gas underneath the earth that forms the seabed in the South China Sea. And that is a massive amount of energy. Uh, there may also be oil reserves, and there are also minerals that lie on the bed of the, uh, of the water, uh, of the bed of the uh, sea, that are there for the taking, that are valuable, that are commercially monetizable and valuable. Um, and this basically is a very rich area from the standpoint of resources, energy resources in particular, and minerals. A third factor is it is a very, uh, pro uh, a, a very rich fishing ground. It is, um, it is a place that accounts for a, a significant swath of the GDP of Vietnam and the Philippines, just in terms of the fishing industry, let alone the energy issue. And it also is a significant source of fish for the world, and for China and for other neighbors. But in terms of Vietnam and the Philippines, their economies hinge to a surprising degree on being able to fish these waters, which you can do if the waters are open seas, and which you cannot do if someone owns those rocks and commands the economic use out to 200 miles, what they call exclusive economic zones, or EEZs. If someone has an exclusive economic zone, you can travel on the surface of the water on a cruise ship or on a canoe, but you cannot perform economic activity if you are a member of UNCLOS, which all of these nations are. UNCLOS being the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. So these are the reasons why this body of water really matters. And I think that China's real reasoning uh, go, involves a number of these different factors. Like all the others, and China's not 
to be singled out, uh, it is interested in developing the energy resources. Like all the others, maybe even to a slightly lesser degree, but still s significant, China is interested in the fisheries. Uh, like all the others, it also sees the South China Sea from the standpoint of geopolitics. And that's a different calculation. So as you look at China at the top of the map, and you look at the sea relative to where China sits, if China, from, from again, from its standpoint, can control these waters or exercise significant influence in these waters, it can, it can give itself what many analysts call strategic depth. That means it can deal with challenges in waters hundreds and hundreds of miles off of the Chinese coast, i.e. potentially military challenges, before those challenges get to be within 13 or 14 miles of the Chinese coast, or even closer, per, in a conflict scenario. So the idea is not just the economics, but from a geostrategic or geopolitical standpoint, creating a cushion, a strategic buffer that gives China additional depth and security that is a very significant calculation, I think. That is not how China talks about the issue, but I think that is more, that is closer to the reality. And let me make one point rather pointedly. If you look at these islands, the Spratlys specifically, toward the, bo toward the bottom or south central part of the map, if you will, uh, where China is building these installations, I'll just walk over and just point to this for a second. islands themselves, and they're, they're, they wouldn't be visible on a map. You'd have to get it to a massive degree of magnification because these are tiny places. But the reason I point to that, it's essentially just under the word Spratlys. And if you think of a little place that is being built out that has a runway, sometimes up to 10,000 feet long, and that has facilities, radar equipment, maybe even missile defense systems, i.e. surface-to-air missiles, if you think of where the word Spratleys is, and you think of that S, let's say, the, at, the, at the end of Spratleys as an island, you can take a series of consensus circles and draw them out. And if China were to operate military hardware off of that island, their reconnaissance planes would have a concentric circle that goes all the way to the coast of Vietnam, all the way to the coast of Malaysia and Brunei, and deep into Philippines territorial waters. That circle would be just about the entirety of the body of water in terms of their, the ability of their planes to go around from the standpoint of their fuel capacity and so on. There would be a smaller concentric circle that would take up basically most of the middle swath of that water that, you know, almost to the coast of Vietnam, almost to the coast of Brunei, that is the range within which their fighter jets could engage. If you take the smallest concentric circle that is sort of a circle just around the word Spratleys right there, let's just say, that doesn't extend all, all the way out, that would be the concentric circle within which surface-to-air missiles could strike targets. So when you think of it as an island, you can't visualize it. When you think of it as an expanding set of concentric circles that represent the radius within which China can do certain military things, then what you start to realize is a little insignificant island that's in the middle of nowhere that is not much bigger than three city blocks in this city, and, only, and two of them were added by dredging sed sediment. That island starts to matter a lot when you talk about what the footprint is from the standpoint of a military capability. That's why this stuff matters, and that's why it is causing alarm in many capitals. Now, let me talk about the other positions on the issue. I've talked about how China sees it. Suffice it to say uh, that leaving aside the case of Taiwan, which again is a quirky case because their claims are identical to China's, but they claim on behalf of the Republic of China, let's leave Taiwan out. They're not a major driver of the issue, and they're not a major problem in this issue. Uh, However, you know, Vietnam, the Philippines, and to a lesser degree, Malaysia and Brunei obviously disagree with what China's doing. 
oppose what, is, what China's doing, take issue with it, are taking steps in some cases to challenge it, and they see the issue very differently. So it can be summarized in that very basic way. But let me spend a little more time talking about the U.S. position. So I've said a couple of times, and it needs to be said, the U.S. does not claim one square inch of land or water in that region. It's not contiguous to our country. We don't own any of it. We don't claim to own any of it. And we are not part of the problem in that sense. However, as I noted, the United States has massive economic interests that go through those waters to the tune of trillions of dollars worth of surface trade on ships. And we have other security interests more broadly in Asia. So the United States takes the point of view that uh, what China has been doing in recent years, which is to say to build out islands and to populate those islands with materiel, equipment, facilities, and in some cases even weapons, most alarmingly, that that has been destabilizing, problematic, and unwelcome from the United States standpoint. Now, what we have said, what the United States has said, is that our interest is in, number one, freedom of navigation through these waters. What we've said is we don't actually take a position on the merits of the legal case about the territorial claims. We actually, as official policy, say that we don't care. What we say that we do care about is that whatever disputes there are, and there obviously are many disputes, that they be resolved peacefully and in a way that does not impede the free navigation of commercial vessels through those waters, and therefore that does not impede or hinder trade and the flow of people, the flow of goods, and so on. So freedom of navigation is the number one stated interest of the United States. Then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in 2010 famously called this, quote, a vital U.S. interest. She was speaking at a, a conference in a, a, a summit of foreign ministers in Southeast Asia, and this was deemed to be a very provocative and troublemaking statement by the Chinese because they saw the U.S. as kind of inserting itself into something, even though we're not saying we own this or we own that. But by calling this a vital interest, Secretary Clinton, on behalf of the United States, was laying down a marker that we care what happens here. And the implication is we're prepared to do something if something happens here that jeopardizes what we regard as our legitimate interests. So since 2010, uh, that broadly coincides with a period of increasing tensions. So freedom of navigation, navigation is a, a key interest. Peaceful resolution of the issue is a key interest. And again, neutrality on the merits of the issue, uh, the merits of the specific bilateral disputes. For example, China and Vietnam both claim this island. We don't say that one is right, one is wrong, nor do we for any disputed territories. And that means, if you take it to its logical conclusion, that if China and Vietnam could come to agreement that that island, for the sake of argument, should belong to China, and they shake hands on it, they sign the papers, the lawyers come together and it's a done deal, then based on our stated policy, we simply accept that. We congratulate them for solving it. We don't have a view. I think there's an interesting question as to whether the United States really feels that way in its heart. But there is not a question as to whether that is the official policy. It is the official policy. So we have an official policy of neutrality. But it is complicated by one important factor. And that is, among the claimants, there is a US treaty ally, the Philippines. And so an alliance means, and different alliances have different founding documents and they're phrased different ways, some are very strong, some are somewhat weaker, but they are a treaty, legally binding alliance. The treaty with, with the Philippines, the alliance with the Philippines, essentially dictates that in a time of need, the United States would be there to support our ally, the Philippines, just as we would Japan, South Korea, Australia, um, and the various other allies that we have around the world, NATO, and so on. But the Philippines is caught up in some very ugly disputes 
with China, where you literally have boats, and here I mean literally, have boats bumping into each other, trying to uh, ram each other, and you have things occurring that are pretty rough and tumble. Not people killing people, not guns, not people firing artillery, but some pretty rough stuff on the seas, where the Chinese will send forces to intimidate Filipinos out of certain waters, the Filipinos will react in other ways, and I'm not assigning blame for purposes of this discussion, but what, is, what I am noting is, if the Philippines should get into a conflict, even though the United States is neutral on the merits of the legal case, we are not neutral about our treaty and legal obligations to defend an ally. By the way, this is the same dynamic relative to the East China Sea, where there is a dispute between China and Japan over eight islands, five islands and three rocks, not far off the northern coast of Taiwan, but that are essentially controlled by and administered by Japan. And we've said we're neutral on that issue, but we're not neutral on the alliance, and if Japan goes to war, we go to war. Now, we haven't said it quite as strongly relative to the Philippines, but that's why all of this matters, because it is not a far-fetched situation to think about a scenario in which this generates a scenario in which the United States enters into conflict in the South China Sea to defend an ally over uninhabited rocks smaller than the surface area of this room. So this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of U.S. security interests. Now, let me turn to a couple of other things that I want to say. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, well, let me, let me also note before moving on to the current state of play briefly that the United States has, in fact, responded in a measured way and in a very specific and conscious way to Chinese actions and what, what we in the U.S. might call China's provocations. China would not use that term about its own actions, but many would sh share a sense of alarm. And what the United States has done is we have stepped up what we call freedom of navigation patrols and sometimes abbreviated as F-O-N-O-P or phonops, but freedom of navigation patrols. And what those patrols are is the United States sending Navy destroyers not only into the region, to the high seas, but even within the 12 nautical mile radius of land that is de facto controlled in some cases by the Chinese. To basically say, we don't like what you're doing, and if you don't like what, these are my words, if you don't like what we're doing, why don't you come stop us? And we're going to sail right through your, not just your EEZ, which is legally permissible, not just your exclusive economic zone, we're going to sail into your territorial waters. It is the legal equivalent of pulling up a tank on the beach, on Venice Beach in Los Angeles. You are entering the territory of another nation. If you grant that that is their territory. And that's the whole point. The United States does not grant that. And we use military measures, freedom of navigation operations, to make that point very emphatically. Suffice it to say the Chinese don't like it. They protest it. They regard it as reckless, destabilizing, provocative. But they don't do anything about it. Because they can't. At least not at this time. So that's the state of play relative to the United States acting on its interest in this, in this body of water. Let me talk about the current state of play overall, just briefly. And a lot of it flows from what we've talked about. Um, China, so I'm summarizing here a little bit, and then I'm going to share a few analytical observations and then, and then conclude shortly thereafter. China has performed substantial reclamation on seven islands. Uh, they've built islands out, they've put facilities, airfields, in one case is up to 10,000 feet, which is enough to accommodate serious military planes, ports, facilities, radar, even military equipment and weapons. The tensions between China and Vietnam and the Philippines have greatly increased in recent years to the point where ships are physically hitting each other in the water and where people are sometimes detained, then they're let go, then others are detained, and it's just a bad 
situation. It is much more tense today than it was four, five, six, seven years ago or beyond or further back beyond that. Uh, the Philippines is currently pursuing a legal case under the auspices of the Permanent Court of Arbitration located in The Hague. Now, this is not a UN entity, but it is considered to be, it is an international entity that is considered to be impartial and that most of the world looks at what they do and regards it to be an impartial mediator uh, and judge in a sense, it is, although it is not technically a legal court, but it is called the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Philippines has filed a case, and the first part of the filing basically said, we contend that this issue, that is our complaints about Chinese behavior in the South China Sea, fall within the jurisdiction of this court. The court found, the Permanent Court of Arbitration found that the Philippines was correct. They then allowed the case to move forward. The Philippines then put forward a case, and that case is now well into processing. And the expectation is that in the coming months there may be a ruling by the, per by the Permanent Court of Arbitration about the uh, legitimacy or illegality uh, of certain Chinese actions in this body of water relative to the Philippines. China has said that it will never accept the judgment of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. They don't have to. There's no, there's no enforcement. Uh, they said they will not. And they're not going to. In fact, they're not even participating in the case. And it's like someone suing you and you don't show up. That probably doesn't augur well for the result for China. But in any case, uh, they simply reject the legitimacy of this court relative to these claims because, again, China sees this as water and land that is, with, that is, that is its sovereign territory. Therefore, no outside force or no outside authority has the, that has the right to judge these matters. That is China's position. But that is part of the current state of play. Um, as I noted, uh, U.S. freedom of navigation operations are continuing. We've had a number in recent months. They will continue. Uh, and there really isn't anything China can do about them. They, they could try to do something, but I think they probably have concluded that would not be a wise thing to do. And so those continue. So there's a very high level of tension between the U.S. and China. And it's also fair to say in terms of the current state of affairs that basically the diplomacy has stalled out. And basically the negotiations, and there have been negotiations, at one point there was a, an ASEAN-China agreement on a code of conduct relative to the South China Sea that was voluntary, it was not binding. But it basically said, this is, these are the principles that we should ab abide by in the South China Sea. Do not provoke, do not be aggressive, you know, communicate. Sort of general, low-hanging fruit principles. And in principle, that went into effect in 2002, but it was non-binding. And the reality is, no, no one has really observed those guidelines. And the fact is, this issue is more or less at an impasse from a diplomatic standpoint. And thus, there is an increase, increased worry that uh, this issue is, is intractable and tensions are rising and the potential for problems or even significant conflict is out there. Now, with that said, let me share a few, as I come toward the conclusion of my comments, let me share a few analytical observations about this whole situation. And, and these are just some interesting points that I think need to be made with the above mentioned comments serving as a kind of backdrop. So first of all, one interesting irony in this entire South China Sea question is the fact that uh, China is a ratified signatory to the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, or what I call, and others call, UNCLOS. However, they themselves essentially acknowledge that they do not adhere to the terms of the agreement to which they voluntarily signed on the dotted line. The irony is that the United States is not a signatory to UNCLOS, but we do adhere to its stipulations. Meanwhile, not being a signatory to UNCLOS, uh, or a ratified sign signatory, 
we don't have the moral high ground to criticize China on UNCLOS grounds because we're not a member of UNCLOS. We're not a member of this convention. So even though we abide by its terms, we lose some moral high ground. And one of the positions that you always hear people make and that I would agree with is that it would be very wise policy for the United States to, to ratify membership in UNCLOS. Because we already adhere to its terms, we might as well get the benefits of the moral high ground and the other protections that are afforded. So that's one interesting point. But I will say, just expanding on the point I made about China, that China has basically said, we are a ratified signatory to UNCLOS, we accept UNCLOS, asterisk, but there are certain historical things that don't quite fit within UNCLOS, they're contradictory to UNCLOS, and wherever there's a contradiction, let's go with the historical argument, not the legal argument, even though we signed on the dotted line and nominally bound ourselves to that document. And so there is this ambiguity and, and frankly inconsistency in China's position. And certainly, many times over the years there's been inconsistencies in the U.S. position on different issues. I'm not singling China out, but on this issue there is a real inconsistency. Second point I would make is that uh, the uh, actions that China is taking in this region are really alienating its neighbors. And they're changing some of the geopolitical dynamics in the South China Sea arena. So for example, uh, just a couple of specific cases, uh, and, and I'm going to relate this to U.S. politics, and Charles and I were talking some U.S. politics earlier, and there's an interesting point to be made here. Um, but Vietnam is not an ally of the United States, although we have friendly relations and, and have built up a warm relationship over these recent years, since around the late 1990s or the year 2000. But now, the United States and Vietnam are actually, in some instances, acting jointly in terms of military exercises, even though we are not allies, because Vietnam is enormously concerned about China's activities, and they are asking the United States, their old adversary uh, from the Vietnam War, but now friend, to come into the region and to play a positive role and to, in a sense, stand shoulder to shoulder with the Vietnamese to express solidarity relative to China's actions. So that's happening. Meanwhile, about 25 years ago, the United States left the Philippines in terms of our military presence there, in terms of bases, even though we maintained the alliance. Now the Philippines are saying, we want you back because of what's happening and because of some nasty disputes. And probably the Philipp Philippines has borne the brunt of China's actions. And Chinese would say that the Philippines have been enormously provocative in their own right. And to some degree, that is also true. But the Philippines is clearly the smaller and weaker power. And they feel, with some justification, that they have been pretty substantially bullied by the Chinese. And there are instances where that is accurate. So now they're saying, United, US, welcome back. We're going to open up, I think it's five bases again, and get you back here into the region. So that's another point to make. A related point uh, is that uh, two other things I would say. Uh, well, on the flip side of the coin is that U.S. actions in terms of the patrols, the, the stepped up freedom of navigation patrols, are comforting Vietnam, the Philippines, and to a lesser degree Malaysia and Brunei, and probably, probably frankly, Taiwan too, <laughs> because they're not really the instigator here. Uh, op, but, but on the other hand, U.S. actions are angering the Chinese who, from their perspective, view the U.S. as the cause of all the problems. I'm not saying I buy into this, but I want to fairly portray their position. And they say that because the U.S. is stepping up these military patrols, which we are, that therefore the U.S., not China, is milita militarizing the region. Therefore, China has to take steps to respond. In my personal estimation, I think the chronology of that argumentation is inaccurate, but that is the argument that the Chinese make. Last couple of points before essentially concluding is that this issue is intractable partly because China regards matters of territorial integrity as what China refers to as core interests. It is a set phrase in Chinese foreign policy. A core interest is essentially is their way of saying 
a rock bottom, bottom line, no, no negotiation possible issue. <laughs> to put it simply, an issue that China would fight a war over. Now they have said, and as a matter of foreign policy doctrine, that territorial integrity issues are by definition core issues. They regard, by the way, Taiwan in the northeast corner of that map as being part of China, even though it is de facto not controlled by China. They regard Taiwan as a core issue. And if Taiwan were to declare independence or if the US were to do certain things relative to Taiwan that encouraged or, or were conducive to Taiwan's independence, or if any nation did, China would fight a war over that. And I, I don't doubt that they would. Whether they'd win or lose is a different question. But they would fight a war to keep Taiwan in the fold, even though today they don't actually control Taiwan. But the notion of them, quote, going independent, they would fight over. The question is, does China regard the South China Sea, which is also a territorial integrity issue, as defined by the Chinese, as a core issue to the same degree as Taiwan? And if so, in fact, then is the implication that China is willing to fight a war for a rock jutting out of the water no bigger than the size of this room. And the technical answer to that, based on their doctrine, is yes. The real world answer may not be yes. And so there is a bit of, again, amorphousness or ambiguity to the stated Chinese policy. So that's out there. And then complicating things further before I conclude here, is the fact that the United States has, quote, pivoted or rebalanced to Asia. Uh, this initiative that President Obama launched in November of 2011, he did so in the parliament, in a speech in the parliament of Australia. And he unf unfurled the so-called pivot to Asia, later came to be renamed or rebranded as the rebalancing, which says that the United States sees as its most important strategic priority for the future the Asia-Pacific region. And we have to resource that accordingly, mostly in an economic and trade sense, but also to a much lesser degree in a military sense. But the fact that we are pivoting to Asia psychically as a matter of doctrine, even if it doesn't make much of a difference relative to our already sub substantial military presence in the region before the pivot, psychically it is a new era in US foreign policy it puts us in the region in a more substantial way, and it brings us into tenser proximity to Chinese naval vessels and military forces than we have been, and that's an uncomfortable position. Let me just conclude by saying, uh, what do people think about as possible solutions? And I'll, I won't delve into these, I'll leave the remaining time for Q&A, but let me just say that when people think about the possible solutions, there are four major things that come up and then I'll mention a fifth one that I think needs to be brought up. And I won't drill down because of time. But let me just say that uh, the one solution, hypothetically, is that, look, we'll never agree, we the claimants, we the six who are on this map, will never agree. Let's, let's stipulate, we will never agree about these islands. Therefore, let's come together and jointly exploit the resources under the water. The fish but more importantly, the minerals, and even more importantly, the energy. We're never going to be able to divide it up, but if we split the difference, do it jointly, all of us will get something more than what we have today. The problem is no one's willing to do it because no one's willing to give up sovereignty. So it's a great idea, but it's not happening and it's probably not going to happen. Second idea, let's have um, a multilateral diplomatic framework that will solve this issue. Great idea. They tried it in 2002, it failed. It is a great concept, but no progress is being made right now. The third basic idea is let us go to international arbitration, but not all the players will accept that, and they don't have to, no one can force them to. As I noted, China will not accept the PCA, the Permanent Court of Arbitra Arbitration's judgment. So nice idea in principle, in a perfect world, there's one arbiter, they're fair, neutral, and then there's a decision, everyone accepts it. In reality, that will not happen. So those are some of the solutions that are put forward. And then a fourth one, 
is a solution, if you will, that would not solve the problem, but it would mitigate some of the symptoms. And that is enhance and increase military to military uh, communications so that you can avoid to the maximum degree possible the um, possibility of inadvertent war through miscommunication. And that means hotlines, it means something called CUES, C-U-E-S, which is a code for unplanned encounters at sea, C-U-E-S. We have that with China, China's a member. That's good, but that treats the symptoms, not the core problems. By the way, I did want to mention one sentence. I said I would mention U.S. politics. At the same time that this issue is playing out, and I'm going to make a point in a nonpartisan sense for purposes here, but to observe something important that's happened. The leading candidate for the, uh, among the Republican would-be nominees, the Republican candidates for president, Donald Trump, has said publicly and recently in the last several days that he believes that we should essentially dispense with the U.S. alliances with Japan and with South Korea, and that further, Japan and South Korea should acquire their own nuclear weapons to defend themselves so that we don't have to keep footing the bill and getting this, as he puts it, unfair deal where we're paying all the dough, we're giving them the nukes, the nuclear umbrella, and they don't have to do anything. These are essentially his words. And he's saying, enough of that. You're on your own. No alliance, no nuclear umbrella. Go for it. Develop nuclear weapons. And that's what the leading the Republican frontrunner has said on the record repeatedly, not accidentally, in the last week. And needless to say, that is generating substantial alarm amongst our allies, who in this case are north of this map, but it also is a signal that's being sent that's resonating in the context of South China Sea. In conclusion, let me just say, uh, and by the way, I think China should clarify its position on the nine-dash line. That would be my fifth recommendation for a solution. As long as they have strategic ambiguity about what their own official position is, you're never going to solve the problem, so that's another one. In conclusion, this is a tough issue. It's going to be with us for a long time. Uh, to answer the question that, is, uh, that was uh, uh, the, the title of this presentation, can military escalation be avoided? The answer is no. Can military conflict be avoided? The answer is probably yes, thankfully. And the, the issues, the core issues at, at the heart of this problem, the legal claims to land and water, will not be resolved in my judgment in the foreseeable future. I don't think in my lifetime. But what can be done is better management of the process so that you take a stalemate and instead of having a volatile and destabilized stalemate, you turn it into a stable and sustainable stalemate where the risk of conflagration and the possibility of inadvertent war is minimized. That's what the policy goal should be, and I'm happy to address more ideas about that as we go forward. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. Look forward to your questions. Thank you. So we're here first, and then over to you, sir. Starting here. Yes. I think that's a very valid observation. Let me take both points. Um, with respect to the Indonesia incident, which in indeed was reported in the New York Times and elsewhere, what happened was um, Indonesia is not a claimant to these waters. But they have their own fisheries, their own waters north of, at the very bottom of the map, you can see Indonesia there. And China actually went in with a military vessel into what it nominally recognizes as Indonesian waters but then basically said, 
these are also historical waters in which Chinese have fished over many millennia, and we uh, are going to not hesitate to use some show of force, some, they actually, I think, pried loose a boat uh, that had been, uh, their own boat that had been uh, basically apprehended by law enforcement authorities. And they took some, they didn't kill anyone or hurt anyone, but they took some ex extremely aggressive uh, moves uh, to uh, basically say, we're not going to allow someone to take our fishermen or, or uh, apprehend or detain one of our boats, etc. And they don't really dispute that this occurred in Indonesian waters, but then they, if I can use the metaphor, muddied the waters uh, by saying that there are historical claims that could be made here too. And you're absolutely right to raise this because it is emblematic of exactly the phenomenon that I was talking about which is that China uses the law when it's convenient to use the law, to which it is a signatory, and nobody forced it to be a signatory. But then, when it's not convenient to use the law, and it's convenient to use historical claims, in that scenario, they're, more, they're happier to resort to those historical claims, and uh, that's what they did in the Indonesia case, and that sends a troubling signal about the potential <coughs> propensity for China to do some of the things that they're doing within those red lines, perhaps even beyond the red lines, that then becomes an even more serious issue. So you're right to raise that. And sorry, the second part of your question yeah, again. Yeah, well, and the fact is China is continuing to, um, to develop these islands, to build them out. Um, I, I think they, my gut sense is that China feels that it has an opportunity to push the envelope to do some things, to test where the limits are, and to do as much as it can get away with. And when it senses that there are going to be real significant and sharp consequences, that, it, that a cost that they're unwilling to pay, they will cease and desist at that point. Um, it's a little bit analogous to the, to the analogy that I use relative to the issue of cybersecurity, uh, which is a different topic, but it's the same mindset. If you... Uh, can get away with cyber espionage and essentially not get called out for it, not get punished for it, even though there may be rhetorical condemnations and so on, you're going to keep doing it so long as the benefits of doing it outweigh the costs. I call it the principle of the parking ticket. If a parking ticket is cheaper than the cost of legal parking, you'll take the parking ticket because it is the economically rational thing to do. And that is a mindset that I think we've seen relative to cybersecurity. I think it is the mindset that I think we'll see a continuation of relative to the issue of the South China Sea. If we can get away with it, we're going to do it. But let me also say, I don't think, and I do not predict, and I hope I'm not wrong, I don't think I will be, I do not predict that we're going to see uh, conflagration and full-scale conflict for a number of reasons. But the main reason is that the United States and China are both nuclear powers, and we are not going to get into a war with each other over a few rocks in the sea. And so ultimately, when push comes to shove, yes, there will be some sharp elbows, yes, there will be some bumps in the night by boats and so on, detaining fishermen, but I think that we're gonna see a stalemate with this new normal over some protracted period of time. So I'm realistic, but not alarmist about what I think the future holds. Do we have time for any I other think, questions? I was going to say, I think we have time for one more question, okay. and then I'm sure Mr. Firestein will stick around for a little bit and Please. chat with those of you that still have remaining questions. Yes, and my apologies for going long. I do apologize for that. Yes, sir. Chinese side or, 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 and the U.S. side. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. These are the kinds of incidents that cause people, a lot of people, to worry about the possibility of inadvertent conflict. A couple of captains or, you know, uh, 
on a boat at a, at a commander level in real time where the action is are having to make decisions in real time um, and may not have a chance to go back and get guidance and so on, that the concern is that could escalate and then someone fires a shot, someone fires a shot back, and then you could actually literally be in a shooting conflict almost by accident. That's the concern. Uh, what I would say is my understanding is it's certainly on the U.S. side. Uh, there is very clear guidance about the rules of engagement, about what we can do, what we can't do. I believe that the U.S. military has really thought through the various scenarios and gamed this out. And I, I, I personally, and I'm perhaps showing a bias, but I worked closely with our military when I was in the U.S. diplomacy, uh, I think there is a lot of care, a lot of planning, a lot of maturity, a lot of good judgment. And I don't lose sleep at night thinking that an error is going to be made on the U.S. side. I also think that, in fairness to China, that not, not suggesting that I agree with many of the actions that they've taken, but I do think that there are protocols in place. They do push limits, they do push envelopes, but I think that there are protocols in place designed to ensure that a, a junior officer does not get China into a war with the United States. Now let me also make one final point here, and I know we're over time, but it's an important point. Uh, I've made the point, and th this, if you, if you noticed what I said earlier, is that many people worry about inadvertent war. I don't, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because there's never been one. And what I mean by that is, even when there are serious incidents that result in deaths, we don't go to war over those scenarios. Even when a country shoots, consciously shoots out of the sky the fighter airplane of another sovereign nation, as Turkey just did with Russia not too many weeks ago, there's no war. When we had a, a, a so-called spy plane or EP3 collision with China, which tragically resulted in the loss of life of the Chinese pilot, although there's sharp debate about where that occurred in the skies and whether it was in open skies or China's territorial skies, if you will. Leaving that aside, the fact is it tragically resulted in the death of a Chinese pilot. And the Chinese believe we wrongly caused that death. That could be construed as an act of war, but they didn't construe it, they did not construe it that way. When we bombed their embassy in Belgrade, killing three Chinese, and the official US position was that it was an accident, and I, I take that at face value, um, and, but, but many don't. We bombed their embassy and killed three people in the embassy. That didn't lead to war. So here's my point. I think there is a concept of inadvertent war, but I think that what we've found in reality is that uh, wars are actually, in this day and age, pretty hard to start. And even if you do something intentional or kill people, um, it, frankly, even the United States selling arms to Taiwan, which if China sold arms to Hawaii, uh, we would, I mean, I mean it, bizarre, it's hard to understand and imagine, but I mean that would be considered almost an act of war in terms of the severity of the violation of our sovereignty. We sell arms to Taiwan, we announced a package as recently as December. They don't go to war with us over that, even though their stated policy is that that is unacceptable and that Taiwan is a core interest. So here's my point. This is why I'm not overly pessimistic about what, what could happen in the South China Sea. Your question is a good one, but I think that the training is there to keep this on the rails, but it needs to be managed and we need to de-escalate it and manage the symptoms of the problem better than we have been. And there are a number of ways to do that that I've laid out. And uh, I don't think we're gonna solve the underlying fundamentals of the problem anytime soon. So we've gotta manage process and manage symptoms. There's room for improvement and I think that's where the hope lies for a more stable situation in the South China Sea. Thank you all so much. Sorry to go over time. Really appreciate it. Thank you.